Good evening. Thank you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. Please note that the opinions voiced by our guests do not necessarily reflect the opinions of this network nor our sponsors. Enjoy the shows. You are listening to WPHM Digital Broadcasting. The best in paranormal talk radio. Reaching all the way back to 1948, Fate Magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown, all of them true. Fate Radio is carrying on that tradition. Here is your host of Fate Radio, Kat Hobson. Good evening. Welcome to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. Hi, this is Fate Mag Radio, and I am Kat Hobson, your host, and I'm so pleased that y'all are here because this is going to be a fantastic show. I have fantastic guests. I guess fantastic's the word of the night, but I have David Weatherly and Ross Allison, and these men are absolutely, positively the real deal. They are probably the best in their fields and they're paranormal investigators they are crypt cryptozoologists and Dave on David's part and I believe that Ross does that as well they are authors each in their own right and they have come together to do that and with great results we have one of their books that just fascinated me I can't wait to have a conversation about David is kind of a renaissance man. He's traveled the world. He is a shaman. He has experienced an awful lot of cool and some would consider bizarre things. I like cool and bizarre, and I know y'all do too, or you wouldn't be here. He is well known. He has been a he has been a radio host. He's been on television. He has appeared at more conferences than we can can go through. He's a lot of fun. And Ross, again, an author in his own right, is absolutely terrific. He is a ghost he is out of Seattle. They are fantastic. He is also the ghost tour operator for Seattle. And I'm going to have to beg his forgiveness because I cannot think of the name. I believe it's Spooky Tours of Seattle. He'll fix that if I'm wrong. And he goes everywhere, too. He has traveled extensively. And you know what? I think anyone that travels is really broadening their mind, broadening their life, and bringing a lot to the game after they are done. So, with that particular trip, because there's always going to be more once you get that bug. And David Weatherly and Ross Allison, welcome to Fate Mag Radio. Hi, Kat. Thanks for having us on. Yeah, thank you. And it's actually spooked in Seattle, just so you know. Spooked in Seattle. Thank you. (laughs) And you know what? I actually knew that because it's written down, and I couldn't find it (laughs) on my notes. But it's been kind of that afternoon, and it's all good. But... I know that um, I am just so excited to be hosting both of you. I've followed your work. I I absolutely 
did not know y'all were writing together until recently. So that was a real treat. How did that come about after being separated by a continent just about, and yet y'all come together and y'all work so well together? (laughs) Actually, you know, we were uh, friends on social media, of course, because we're in the same field. And uh, I and some of my travels ended up in Seattle and um, went to Spoot and took a, a ghost tour, took a private ghost tour with Ross around Seattle. And, um, you know, afterwards we just kind of chatted some back and forth. And I, I just, I shot him an email out of the blue one day and said, you know, you have any interest in working on a project together? Um, I'm sure Ross will say the same thing. You know, I'm always looking at different ways to explore aspects of the field and so forth. And, uh, we just kind of started bannering some ideas back and forth that we both had. And the result actually was the first book haunted toys, Mm -hmm. uh, which we, we thought was a a very unusual concept and no one had done it. So, uh, we wrote that and then decided to uh, keep going that there's, you know, potential for a lot of different areas that hadn't really been explored too much. And, uh, our, our writing styles melded together easily enough. Um, and since then, you know, we've put out, of course, Haunted Ships and Lighthouses. Haunted Churches is coming out uh, fairly oh. soon. We have several more that are already in the pipeline. And uh, we get a chance to lecture together here and there. And, and uh, it's just been it's it's been a really cool working partnership. I, I have a lot of respect for Ross. I consider him a good friend. And, you know, that certainly makes a big difference, I think, in our ability to get this material out there in, in a really entertaining fashion, but also very informative fashion. We have uh, similar approach to some things, but we have different backgrounds in a sense too. So I think it strengthens both sides of, of the uh, equation. That was very kind of you, David. I'm sure I'll be getting a bill in the mail, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's great. Uh, I agree. You know, we've, we've had a wonderful working uh partnership and uh i i've been enjoyed you know been doing the books with him lecturing with him and you know doing these events with him well i think that everything that i am reading everything that i've seen the videos that i have watched um i've listened to other interviews with y'all y'all do great together i mean it was a good call on the collaboration effort. Well, it's only because you get us on days when we're highly medicated. That's why. (laughs) (laughs) Well, then that energy level leaves one to go, gosh, I wish I had that. That... that, That's that's me being highly caffeinated, which is slightly different, but uh, you know, it, it it works out both ways. We've both been in the field a very long time and, Mm -hmm. you know, I've got, I started this stuff in the 1970s and I know Ross wasn't too far behind me, uh, although he'll deny that he's that close to my age. But, uh, <laughs> you know, all of that aside, uh, the benefit has been that, you know, we're both very well traveled and we've both had the opportunity to work with a lot of different people and, and still do. And as I stated earlier, you know, this has been a great avenue to get some other information out there, sometimes on topics that really aren't discussed very much, like the haunted toys and the haunted churches. And sometimes we address something that, you know, intrigues a lot of people like haunted ships and lighthouses, which, uh, of course, is the one we're we're discussing, I think, primarily tonight. Yes, because that one rocked my boat. I have (laughs) been. It did. I have been. That's great to hear. A ghost ship hunter, as much as I can, for a very long time, I met a friend who is a ghost ship hunter. He's a former Hollywood stuntman who lives in um, Europe now, and he's fantastic. He is someone who will take anyone along on his adventures. He's fantastic he's one of those people that you know he buys all these toys and goes to children's hospitals every year and it's just fantastic his name is um, captain rob mcdonald but he is who turned me on to this subject years ago i didn't even know it was a thing and come to find out it's a huge thing 
Some Some of the pictures I've seen are amazing. It's, I think they're easier to find than Bigfoot, actually. (laughs) 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 Based on my experience. But I think that to actually come out, y'all covered two lighthouses that I've actually actively investigated. Pensacola Lighthouse, I was able to do a very small four-person overnight investigation in. So... I was interested in what y'all had, had shared there because it was accurate. Oh, cool. But I, there were ships I'd never heard of that y'all included also. And I think it's neat, Ross, that you're going to be able to host your your tours on one. Yeah, Ross was just on one last night. He was on the Turner Joy. Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we do the Turner Joy uh, once a month uh, through Spooked in Seattle Ghost Tours. We even do overnights. We can fun. Well, I just think that that's awesome. I love when people can just come to y'all and say, oh, well, this was one of the ones that you wrote about. And mm-hmm. then they get to experience that. I know that when I was on the Queen Mary, I'd just gone for lunch one afternoon after an event. And I'd never been there, so I wanted to see it. And I drove down, and it's the real deal also. And I really no, wasn't a, yeah, expecting and, it. Yeah, it's and a great know, ship. Honestly, yeah, honestly, we only kind of scratched the surface because uh, in some ways this one was really easy uh, in terms of finding material. And on the other hand, you know, we had to decide, okay, which ones are we going to include and, and which ones don't we because – uh, we did combine both the ships and the lighthouses in the same book, but, you know, really we could probably easily do, you know, a couple of other volumes just of locations around the United States yes. uh, and, and ship and ships along in the United States, um, you know, regional waters. Uh, we didn't do anything international in this book. And of course that really broadens the scope a lot outside of addressing a couple of the iconic uh, quote, you know, ghost ships like the um, flying Dutchman, uh, right. But, you know, we, we wanted to use those to help people understand this whole idea and, and part of the reason why people are so fascinated with, with ghost ships. And for me, you know, this was a really cool project to do because I spent the early part of my life uh, around the coastal waters of North Carolina. And, you know, I spent a lot of time when I was young and a teenager in basically in Blackbeard stomping ground along the Outer Banks mm-hmm. of North Carolina. And that's that's the graveyard of the Atlantic. There are just tons of legends down there involving ghost ships and, uh, you know, the ghost of, of pirates and sailors and, and all kinds of legends surrounding the lighthouses down there. So that alone was, you know, made it really intriguing for me. And then, of course, there's this mystique that arises whenever we look at these nautical subjects, you know, the, oh, yes. the stark isolation and loneliness of a lighthouse the you know the concept of what these early sailors had to encounter and deal with to make a vessel uh, to make a journey on these early vessels because you know people a lot of times don't think twice about that now we can jump on an airplane and then a matter of hours be you know halfway around the globe but in in the early days you know the method of travel was by ship and gosh, in the really early days, it was by sail, which took a very, very long time. And, you know, it took a very particular type of person to be able to do that for a living and to deal with the, the uniqueness and the the solitary aspects and, you know, being out in the vast middle of the ocean. So in a way, there's no surprise that so much, strange lore has grown up around these these ships and of course the white houses even though they're land-based there's a similar quality because very frequently these were uh, locations that were very isolated you know sometimes these people manning these lighthouses were a, a day or sometimes several days away from a town and supplies and things like that so again it was a very solitary a very unique type of existence that they experienced it was also, too, very dangerous as well, you know, being out yes. in the middle of the ocean, you know, mm-hmm. having to deal with the the storms that would occur, 
uh, even in the lighthouses, the isolation, but also too, uh, some lighthouses weren't also weren't you know, isolated on an island. They had to deal with, you know, unfortunately, Native Americans that would come in and attack as well, and all kinds of other things that would happen. Well, and for those that were isolated, you know, it's nothing if you have a strong enough hurricane. It doesn't even have to be a hurricane, really. A strong enough storm, you're going to get rogue waves. You're going to get such wave action that it will cause erosion on the island where these are built. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, you're constantly inundated by problems of all kinds. Like you said, the Native American sometimes just the rogue people passing through generally knew how isolated these locations were and that there wouldn't be but, but two, very rarely three families on site. Right. So it was a, it was a strong vulnerability. I liked where you included the, the cases, speaking of which, where, the women had to take over. Oh, yeah. And the yeah. demise of their husband or, you know, the illnesses of spouses. And the women had to step up. And a lot of times they were the only people still in the area who could become the new light keeper. Right. In fact, um, one of my favorite stories uh, actually is uh, Boone Island Lighthouse. And that's a, a story of a couple that were, you know, working at the lighthouse. Of course, a bad storm comes through. And so the the husband, he ties a rope to himself. And, of course, the other end, she's got a hold of the other end. And he goes out to try and relight the lighthouse because it had gone out. And, of course, after a while, you know, she's not feeling any movement from the rope. And so, you know, she's, you know, calling out Luke, 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 you know, no response. And so she finally, you know, starts to pull in the rope. And when she finally uh, pulls it in, she realizes that, you know, he is dead. Oh, wow. And, yeah. Oh, yeah. Of course, you know, now she has to deal with the grief. But, of course, she also take, takes it upon herself to go out and try and, you know, light the lighthouse as well, you know, so that no other people will die. So she, you know, gets out there, she lights a lighthouse and she has to spend, you know, the next few days, you know, just holding on to her dead husband. And after a while, you know, no one had heard from anybody from the lighthouse after the storm had passed and they go out, you know, and check on her and they find her dead holding her husband. And so, you know, some of the ghost stories are that, you know, late at night when there is a storm of brewing, you will actually hear a woman, you know, yelling out into the night sky, Luke, Luke. Oh, yeah. I love that you used the word a brewing. <laughs> Seriously, that was perfect. Oh, that's great. But, you know, it's, um, I am a lighthouse aficionado. If I find one, I climb it. And my husband thinks I'm insane. He won't go up all of them with me because some of them are sturdier looking than others. And he doesn't like the ones that don't have, I don't either, the ones that don't have the center handrail, you know, uh -huh. by the, by the post where they pulled up the, the flammables, but they're just beautiful and they do oh, take yeah. you back. Every time you step in one, you're going back in time. It's like you a know, whole it's, little it's, time capsule. Some of the deepest, darkest places you could imagine. Some of the most terrifying places. But my biggest fear is heights. So I have not been able to climb to the top of the lighthouse. And I got to go to, you know, to uh, St. Augustine Lighthouse. Mm -hmm. And I got, I think, to like the third flight. And I was just like, okay, that's enough. <laughs> I know <laughs> well, that's ghost, one that the doesn't have the rail. Seen here, I will hang out here. <laughs> there you go. Somebody has to be here. You know, we yeah. take a we take a break at 20 minutes after the hour, and it's about that time. But we are going to be right back with Ross Allison and David Weatherly, and we're going to continue this discussion. And I think y'all are going to like it because the book, Haunted Ships and Lighthouses, is amazing. Voice of Experience. We'll be right back. You are listening to WBHM. 
Digital Broadcasting. The best in paranormal talk radio. Come on, I'm Southern, but, um, nope. That'll do. Hello, I am Kat Hobson, host of Paranormal Experience here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I enjoy having guests from all areas of the paranormal, from ghosts to ufology to cryptids and beyond. You'll find some of the best researchers in their fields bringing you some great information. Join me on Wednesday nights from 8 to 10 p. Eastern here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Son of a... Hey, son. Mother... (laughs) Uh, son, what are you doing? Hey, mom. I'm getting ready to listen to Periscope Uncensored. By expanding your vocabulary. Well, it is uncensored. Son, the uncensored part of Periscope Uncensored is Jax and I getting down to brass tacks with all aspects of the paranormal. There's no fluff on our show. So, no off-color commentary? I didn't say that. Awesome! (laughs) Son? Uh, I just hit my head. Oh boy, I'll go get you an ice pack. Catch Periscope Uncensored Thursday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern, only on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Since 1948, Fate Magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown. All of them true. Fate Radio is carrying on that tradition, bringing you the unusual, macabre, strange, and bizarre. Join host Cat Hops Sunday nights from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, Birmingham, Alabama. Thank you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is 23 minutes after the hour. Welcome back to Fate Mag Radio. I am your host, Kat Hobson. And I am fortunate enough this evening to be joined by two people whose work I admire so much, and I'm very pleased to be discussing it with them, David Weatherly and Ross Allison. Welcome back, guys. Thanks, Good to be here. And we were discussing your book, and Haunted Ships and Lighthouses, and yeah, I wanted to touch on something before we move on with this. The book Haunted Toys, Mm -hmm. are these toys like Annabelle toys, like that level of hauntings? Uh, We we cover Annabelle and, you know, we cover, we cover a number of haunted dolls, uh, but then also other toys that are haunted. And we also cover games. Uh, And, you know, again, it was something that, no one had really done much with. And, uh, you know, we decided to, to kind of delve into that and, and came up with some pretty cool and creepy stories. Well, I have just perused it. I haven't gotten really into it because I was so absorbed with the haunted ships and lighthouses, but I can't wait. I'm going to enjoy <laughs> that. So, you know, and it's one of the things too, you know, I know Dave was talking about the series, um, or haunted series a little earlier, but one of the things that I really like um, when we are doing these projects and as we, you know, sit down together and try to, you know, divvy up the stories and stuff is, you know, we are also trying to add new stories, stories that haven't been published out there before. Mm -hmm. Um, Because, you know, I know when people pick up a lot of these haunted books, it's always the same stuff over and over and over again, you know, and, you know, me and David being collector of books ourselves, you know, we didn't want our, our fans to have to deal with that as well. 
So we do strive to come up with new stories to add to these. You know, of course, we want to throw in a few of the, you know, iconic places. But then we also Mm -hmm. want to throw in some new stuff for people. But then also there's been a few of the stories that we put in the book, especially with lighthouses and uh, ships, where we actually, you know, debunked it. Mm -hmm. Uh, We talked about, you know, yeah, this place has been talked about being haunted. But after our research, we found out it's not haunted. And, you know, we decided to throw a few of those in there you know, to really show that we are really serious about what we do here. It's not, you know, just telling the ghost stories. It's also helping to put an end to some of these, you know, fake stories as well. Well, you did that in Pensacola. Oh, yeah. So yeah. I was I was appreciative of that because I spent, I don't even know how long there. But I did have experiences. There is a keeper's wife there who is still very protective of the children in that structure, as I found out. Mm -hmm. But um, I didn't do anything with ill intent, but I I did leave something in the quarters when we went into the actual structure of the lighthouse. And I had to run back and get it, and I was running. And as I hit the stairs going up in the keeper's quarters... This big black mass just went whoosh, like, then went way big, and I was like, eh. "Wow!" Don't have any negative intent. I just left something in that room. I promise. I'm a mom. I don't, yeah, you know, I don't mess with kids. I'm just here to get. In fact, you can look. There's a piece of equipment sitting right there, and I'm, <laughs> I'm seriously, I am reasoning with a black mass. <laughs> It was like <laughs> it was the strangest thing I've ever done, but it, it had to happen. But and it did. It, it kind of just like settled, you know, like when a cat gets spooked and the fur goes big and the tail goes bushy. Oh yeah, sure, like that. And when I got done, it was still very tense, but it let me through, and I didn't feel threatened. So I skedaddled, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> went on to do other things in the lighthouse. <laughs> but that is a great location. But some of the things that you included that that had not really been covered before, what was your favorite that was off the beaten path? You want to go first? Oh, gosh. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, there's quite a few of them. I, one that jumps to mind right off that is kind of not on many people's radar is the Point Lookout Lighthouse. Mm -hmm. And that's in Maryland. Uh, The intriguing thing about it, now, I I will say that years ago it got a lot of attention because uh, Hans Holzer once investigated the Mm -hmm. lighthouse. But the history of the place is just really fascinating. And first of all, it doesn't look like the... uh, typical archetype of a lighthouse it's a sort of a a square kind of squat building that is um two stories with a with a lower basement level and then a small tower that sits on top of this building and the the haunted history of the lighthouse it goes back really to the civil war Uh, the lighthouse was built in the mid 1820s and by the outbreak of the Civil War, <clears throat> there was uh, a decision made by the federal government to utilize the area around the lighthouse as a prison camp. So Union soldiers were stationed there, and they fenced off this huge area around the lighthouse itself. And they began to ship in captured Confederate soldiers. Now, the estimates at the time were that they could hold a maximum of uh, 10,000, 9 or 10,000 enemy combatants in this area. And the Battle of Gettysburg came along, which added 9,000 captives alone to this Mm -hmm. camp. Uh, By the end of the war, the official estimates say that there were at least 20,000 prisoners in Astounding. this area and and that is uh the the official estimate which some people say was really underestimated that there were actually more and it, it's hard to say you know because there are discrepancies with 
some records and so forth during that time period. Uh, but at, at the very least, we know that there were twice the number of people that they originally felt, you know, was the maximum. So you can imagine the trauma that resulted just from those close quarters and all of these enemy combatants being held and watched over by very nervous union guards. You know, you can imagine being a, a guard uh, trying to monitor this many prisoners. There's not many of you and there's a whole lot of them. And, uh, and the they long don't and like short you. is that, uh, that that's right. And, and, you know, they just want to get out. They just want to get home. Uh, so, you know, that's part of what has made this area and, and the White House in particular haunted because there are a lot of reports uh, from this White House and it, its surrounding grounds about uh, people seeing Civil War soldiers. Uh, some of them have witnessed these soldiers so clearly that they thought uh, it was, you know, a reenactor in the area for some kind of event or something. And these soldiers have been seen on the grounds. They've been seen uh, marching along one of the uh, roads that leads up to the, the White House. And there have been other things captured there, too. There have been EVPs captured of uh, voices that say things, you know, like uh, fire if they move. And it sort of implies that maybe some of the guards are still hanging out there. And then the White House, too, itself. Uh, there are legends about activity within the White House. People, uh, old keepers that had lived in the house reported uh, some poltergeist-like activity at various times. And to top all of that off, there was originally a family cemetery on the grounds of this White House. Well, somewhere along the way, the stones, the headstones that were there disappeared. Mm -hmm. And uh, this small little cemetery, which was called uh, the Taylor Cemetery, it was the Taylor family. Uh, after these stones, these headstones disappeared, there started to be reports of people seeing a woman roaming around the beach near the White House as if she was searching for something. In fact, a park ranger at one point encountered, encountered this woman, and she seemed very distraught. She seemed to be searching for something, and when the ranger approached her, she seemed very irritated. Well, it was later discovered that the description of this woman, quote, uh, matched the identity of a woman who had been buried in the Taylor Cemetery. Much later on, it was discovered that one of those headstones uh, turned up in a nearby hotel. Someone had just carried it over there and made I it part of a display so or weird. something at one point. So, you know, it's it's one of these places. It's not on a lot of people's radar, but it it just has so many layers of historical things that that make that sort of divine storm where we can say, "Wow, there's so many reasons this." White House and these grounds could be haunted that it's sort of like, you know, take your pick. Uh, maybe one, maybe all of these things are causing the activity that occurs at that location. Well, you know, both of you have been investigators long enough that you know the difference between residual and active activity and things of that oh, sure. nature. I mean, right. and not only that, what Gaveball takes a headstone to a cemetery. That was just, yeah. when I read that, yeah. that just struck me as like, seriously. <laughs> that was bonehead. But, yeah. well, what about you? Yeah. What's your, what's your favorite off the wall or off the, off the grid unknown experience? Oh. I, I think for me, when I was doing the book, um, one of my favorite stories that I got to add that was has never been done before, never been written about, is the uh, Dominion Tug. Mm -hmm. That's a, an old wooden tugboat uh, from the 1940s. And it actually was built by the military as a military tug. Um, but then it, after a while, it started changing hands. Um, in fact... Um, I think it was, uh, if I remember correctly, it was by the uh, early 2000, after it changed so many different hands, um, 
Dave um, Clark, who is now the current owner, he had actually uh, purchased the boat. And it had, and before this, it had actually been owned by the Foss uh, family uh, who used it for logging, that type of stuff. So there's a lot of history there. Um, but again, by the time Dave got it, it was pretty much uh, almost on its last legs. And he, he tells the story that, you know, on his first night on the ship, you know, he was just sitting on the ship and he happened to watch a, um, a familiar ship go by that was owned by a really good friend of his that he had, re, you know, referred to as a mentor for him when he, he got into the, the sailing field. And he had just set out, you know, this little prayer just, you know, like for guidance, you know, to help him with this. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, he still struggled to try and keep the ship afloat and, and try to do something with it. And as things got worse, um, you know, of course, he was, you know, putting out calls to all of his friends, trying to figure out what he was going to do. He um, he actually has this really weird experience where, you know, he's on the phone talking to a friend of his and all of a sudden he gets the sensation that something comes up behind him and it actually, he says it goes through him mm -hmm. and he sees something walk away from him into the darkness. And he describes, you know, to be a guy in overalls, you know, and after that, he started to realize, well, maybe there's something more to this ship. And so um, he ends up getting a hold of some friends that were into the paranormal and they do a little investigation and they, you know, claim to have had, you know, experienced something. But after, you know, all these experiences started happening, you know, it says it's almost like the ship came alive. You know, things started to get better for the ship as he started to acknowledge, you know, the phenomena that he was experiencing. And, you know, things, you know, started to get better. The ship was, you know, starting to, you know, come alive. And, you know, of course, we come along. And, I, and it was funny how I came across this, too, is I was actually, I, as, as you know, I do a lot of work on the USS Turner Joy. Mm -hmm. And I had noticed uh, on the same dock is, you know, this old tugboat, you know, and it, it looked like it had, you know, seen better days. And I just thought, oh, you know, this is a really cool tugboat. It might have some, you know, stories. So, of course, you know, I walk up to it and there's Dave, you know, on the dock, you know, and, and, and I get to talking to him. And, you know, of course, you know, once I ask the question, well, is it haunted? <laughs> you know, he just <laughs> lights up, you know, and he's got all these, you know, you know, stories to tell. And when we finally got to do our investigation, um, uh, June, uh, my VP, she probably had the most experiences. Um, she was, we were spending the night there and, uh, she actually was having a hard time sleeping. And, uh, as she was, you know, kind of, you know, in and out, she, she actually hears somebody walking along the middle grade. And, uh, she believes, you know, one of us, you know, one of the other investigators are coming to, you know, to check on her. And so she just kind of sits up and she's, you know, looking into the darkness, waiting for one of us to step out. And, of course, no one's stepping out of the darkness. And this has been a phenomenon that has been reported quite often, hearing somebody walking along the metal grade. In fact, um, Heather, who is one of the volunteers on the ship, she uh, volunteers quite a bit because she believes that it's her grandfather that actually haunts the ship. He actually worked on it when it was uh, part of the Foss family. And wow. so she feels this, you know, very uh, deep connection with the ship. And so she's done a lot of amazing work for Dave uh, in trying to keep the ship, you know, going and doing a lot of, you know, benefits for the ship. And so, you know, it, it's just been a great place. It's been, you know, really neat to ha have the opportunity to investigate it. And it's also been a huge honor to include it in the book um, because one of the things that I learned is when we actually – had written about it, uh, they were suffering on trying to get some um, grants to try and keep the ship going. And come to find out, it was because of our book that they were granted um, some more money to help uh, things out. And so that was that was amazing. That is amazing. And yeah. that's fantastic. You know, you don't think about, or a lot of people don't realize that even the places that allow tours and that, you know, host different events, 
there's a lot of involved, especially with a ship, with the upkeep. You know, if you're going to have it in the water, maintaining that is really expensive. Oh, yeah. Kind of silly not to have a ship in the water if you're trying to let people experience the hauntings that occurred there. Right. And, and that's the thing, you know, when, when we write about these books, you know, the one reason why I chose to, to write books was because somebody, you know, made a very clear point to me. It's just, it's sad that, you know, a lot of these stories are easily forgotten. Mm -hmm. um, if it's not published, it's not forever. So that, that kind of, you know, struck me and I was just like, you know, you're right. It's like, you see a lot of these groups popping up left and right. And unfortunately they get bored with ghost hunting because it's not as exciting as TV makes it out to be. So a lot of these groups, you know, whether, you know, it's drama in the group or boredom or, you know, whether, you know, they just life changes, you know, that, um, a lot of these, you know, incredible investigations that they get to go on or even evidence that they've collected is gone with them, you know, mm -hmm. and, and that's where I feel it is so important that we share these stories and experiences so that we can get it out there. We can publish it so that they're never forgotten because I feel at least we're doing the paranormal field a, a great service by getting that knowledge out there for people. That is a great and frankly, beautiful point. That's one of the reasons that I have hard copies of mm -hmm. books. I I feel like that's how to maintain history because I haven't found a digital storage system yet that didn't have glitches or, you know, have some issue that prevented me from being able to access information off of it after a while. My books yeah, are have... always there. Yeah, I haven't tried trusted hard drives myself, you know. Exactly. It's like just just download the movies. I'm like, I still want like, <laughs> I don't think so. Format, you know. <laughs> and if I, I pay I'm the, for I'm it. the same way. And uh, you know, I, I as I sit here in a, a pretty massive library, uh, and Ross made some excellent points. And you know, there's there's yet another aspect to this uh, that I can add too, and it's that you know we have so many. Uh, ghost hunting teams or you know enthusiasts and everything now and i see so many of these people they get focused on what they're going to get so you know they'll rush into one of these locations and when you ask them about the experience it'll be like yeah well the REM pod went crazy uh or you know i, I call mm -hmm. an evp but they can't tell you anything really about the place or about the stories and you know, many, many of these hauntings, it's really, it, it's, it's not something that can fit into a tweet. You know, it's not that <laughs> simple. A lot of these, right. a lot of these ghost stories, as we delve into them, they're, they're very complex. And I, I can tell you that both Ross, that, that both myself and Ross, you know, we work really hard at getting to, trying to get to the core of a lot of these tales. And it's not always easy. And, and sometimes, all we can do is, you know, pass along, okay, this is what's out there and, and this is what's happening. And these are the stories as we know them at this time. Uh, but, you know, it, it takes, and it's going to take more work even after we're gone, people to really delve into these things. And sometimes, you know, it's a unique blend of history and folklore and all kinds of other things. And, and we don't, we may never know the absolute truth as to what occurred, especially at some of these isolated locations like lighthouses. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm going to have to interrupt y'all with that being said, because we have another break and we'll be right back. You are listening to WBHM, digital broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk only on Paranormal Experience Radio. Broadcasting live, live, live out of Birmingham, Alabama.
you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is 45 minutes after the hour. Welcome back to Fate Mag Radio here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I am Kat, and I am joined tonight by David Weatherly and Ross Allison, and we have just been having the best discussion. And they were discuss- you were discussing just now, you know, your writing and the work that goes into it and the research. And during the break, I, I mentioned that I feel like this is completely an historic record that y'all are creating. And I appreciate that. Well, thank you. You know, we, we do our best with what, you know, we're able to find, you know, what's at our hands. Um, but like David said, it, there's still a lot more work that needs to go into it. We don't have all the answers and, you know, we may never have the, all the answers, especially in our lifetime. Um, so, you know, we, we do everything we can just to get that information out to everybody because we do feel it's very important. That's why we're anomalous researchers, right? Yep. yep. Absolutely. Seeking that that sometimes is really, really elusive. Mm-hmm. But, well, I am... I could talk about this book forever. <laughs> so <laughs> y'all may get tired sitting here. And yes, that is my creaky chair. But, um, you know, I think that choosing this topic, David, I know that you said that you spent a lot of time on the Outer Banks growing up. And that is a ship graveyard. That is such treacherous shoreline. But, and Ross, have you always, did you grow up in Seattle? Yep. Born so and you're raised both coastal guys. Yeah. But we got, you know, our fair share of, you know, a, a graveyard out in our waters as well. Yes. You know, because a lot of boats and ships were trying to head up towards the Alaska Gold Rush. And uh, many of them did make it as well. Well, I think that those were such intrepid voyagers because... I am brave and strong most of the time. I just don't think I could see myself being in Portugal or Ireland or anywhere else going, you know what? I think I'm going to get on that little three masted ship and sail the ocean blue and find hopefully a new home. Right. (laughs) I mean, I've got a home, right? Right. But I do think that, that those people, especially of that time were so fierce and, so just full of wonder i can't imagine being strong enough to leave everything i knew in the hopes of finding something right and it does take a certain type of person to live that lifestyle yes you know especially in a lighthouse you know to be so secluded and taken away from the rest of the world and that to me is probably almost like you know living the life in a prison you or know, a Mars. You're, you're, yeah you're you're not being punished for anything but yet you're doing what you can for mankind to make sure that they have a safe voyage home it so is a calling it, it is it is it definitely is because yeah that was exactly why they were there because they didn't make a ton of money. They didn't have any place, of course, to spend the money they were making. But. Yeah, for know, a lot of them, you know, it was a chance to advance in their career because they would go out and, you know, serve on, at a lighthouse for a short time, sometimes a year, maybe two. Mm-hmm. And it would allow them to advance in their career because you're right. They weren't making a lot of money doing this, but they were offered, you know, food and shelter. You know, mm-hmm. especially for their families as well, because they'd bring their families out to to live this lifestyle. Can you imagine being a child growing up in that environment? You know, I you... can see why they would have haunted toys. <laughs> no <laughs> doubt. <laughs> Without a doubt. You, you know, there's there's a lighthouse that kind of uh, encompasses some of the things that we've been talking about with this, and it, it's. I think it's a really cool story. It's, it's the new London Ledge Lighthouse, mm-hmm. which is off the coast of Connecticut. Now, for anyone not familiar with this, I encourage you to go on and Google images of this lighthouse. It is, 
it's really kind of stunning. It's a, a small square building. It sits on a rock in the water, uh, literally. literally. And it, it, you know, there's a, a fantastic photograph that someone took of that White House with these waves kind of crashing up beside it. It's, it's in black and white. And it gives you this sense of the isolation that people must have experienced working in that White House. Now, of course, it's in the book because there are ghost stories associated with it. And <clears throat> reportedly, the New London Ledge White House is haunted by a former keeper named Ernie. Now, this is one of those stories that reflects back on what I was saying a few moments ago in that it is not a simple story. Uh, people have experienced different things at this lighthouse over the years. And this legend rose up that the spirit that was haunting it was a former keeper named Ernie, whose wife had grown tired of the isolation of living on this rock in the water. And she ran off with the captain of a, a ship. Now, Ernie was so distraught that he climbed to the top of the tower and he dove off into the rocks or the water below to his death. Or maybe he cut his own throat with a fishing knife. Or maybe his name wasn't Ernie, maybe it was John Randolph. <laughs> and yes. that's kind of the tip of the iceberg that you run into when you start looking into this story. Now, I was able to kind of get to the root of the Ernie tale in that it turned out to have come from a psychic who visited the lighthouse in uh, the early 1980s. I think it was 81. And she gave a reading and told the people that, yeah, it's, it's this former keeper named Ernie and he's distraught. And, and she kind of wove this whole tale that really over time has become part of the folklore about the place and it's it's isolation and the you know the the starkness of being in that location because it was operated by the coast guard uh, for many many years it's now if i recall correctly it's now a historical site but you know one of the former coast guard officers who served at that lighthouse wrote a journal entry on his last day at the White House, and um, in fact, I'm pretty sure it was the last log at the station because they were they were formally closing it down. But part of the entry that this Coast Guard officer wrote was "Rock of Slow Torture, Ernie's Domain, Hell on Earth," and he went on to proclaim that uh, you know basically Ernie could have the rock and and that. He hopes the light would shine on, but he's going to be watching it from a distance while drinking a brew uh, because he had just had enough of being at this location. Now, you know, we can look at parts of the story and say, OK, well, yeah, this is debunked because, you know, a psychic claimed it and there's no historical record of Ernie or John Randolph or who, whatever version it is. However, there are people who have had valid experiences in this White House. Uh, there have been reports of poltergeist like activity. There have been phantom footsteps, you know, disembodied voices, and both from just people being stationed there or visiting and from people investigating the location. They've walked away with evidence. Mm -hmm. So it becomes one of these very entangled situations where we think, wow. You know, what exactly is the truth of the story here? Sadly, at the moment, we don't exactly know, but we know there's something very intriguing about the location beyond the simple isolation and uniqueness of the lighthouse itself. Great point. Because just because part of it isn't provable, it doesn't just rule out out or nullify the history that creates these kind of things. So. And, uh, and the thing is, you know, and, and continuing on, you know, what David had to say is this is nothing new. 
You know, as an author in researching a lot of this stuff, you find a lot of these stories do tend to uh, be rooted to one time a psychic came in and said, Mm -hmm. "Yes, you know, but we have no validation of how credible this psychic is. But yet it becomes now part of the legend uh, of these locations. And it's not just the lighthouses. It's for a lot of these historic locations. And and that's where the challenge begins for us. You know, when we start to research a lot of these places is, as he said, you know, we're, we're trying to find the root to a lot of this and we can't always find it. But in some cases, you know, like his example, you know, we are able to sometimes trace it down to a psychic, but that does not make it that that's what, you know, actually happened at this location just because a psychic said, you know, exactly. Because I know an awful lot and I tend to get readings from places and such of my own. A friend of mine said, why don't you tell people that you're a psychic? And I'm like, because I'm wrong a lot. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I I do have gifts, but I'm not going to tell somebody something that may cause them to make a decision mm-hmm. on what I said when I know that I'm not 100%. I'm, I'm not going to do that. It works for me and I'm happy with it working for me. So, right. And and a lot of this too, you know, like you said too, is, you know, sometimes the psychic is there for a reason because people are experiencing things. Yes. So these places are truly haunted, but as to who or, or why that's still the mystery for a lot of these places. And it's so much fun researching mysteries. uh, famous, if you will, example of what we're talking about here is actually the Queen Mary. And, you know, I don't want to ruffle any feathers or upset people, but, uh, well, then again, I might, because, <laughs> you know, here's, here's the thing with the Queen Mary, probably the most famous ghost uh, that people talk about on the Queen Mary is that of a little girl named Jackie. Now, Jackie is purportedly the spirit of a girl who drowned in the swimming pool mm-hmm. uh, while the ship was a, an active cruise uh, ocean liner. And her spirit uh, supposedly still hangs around. Now, here's the thing. The tale of Jackie dates back to a psychic who worked on board the Queen Mary, uh, a very well-known gentleman named Peter James, who... Uh, At the time, he appeared on a lot of episodes of, uh, if people remember the show, Sightings, Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, another number of other shows. And he's the one that really brought in Jackie and and the whole tale involving her. But again, we go back to the historical record. There's no record of a little girl drowning in that pool, you know, a a little, little girl named Jackie. Where did she come from? Uh, now, this does not necessarily discount that that there's the spirit of a little girl on there because people through the years have captured evidence of what seems to be the spirit of a little girl. You know, there are EVPs. People have heard disembodied voices. You know, uh, they've seen anomalous things on on cameras and in photographs all in that pool area. And there are a lot of indications that, wow, yeah, maybe it is this little girl. But, you know, we kind of go down the rabbit hole when we start talking about this, because is it something else taking the form of a little girl? Uh, Is this something that's being created by the collective consciousness? Because Mm -hmm. so many people go there searching for evidence of Jackie, who they believe is there. So, you know, my thing is I just encourage people to investigate deeper, you know, research a little bit deeper and find out what the roots of some of these things are uh, so that you're, you know, you're armed with more knowledge when you go into the locations. Great Mm -hmm. point. I'm going to stop us here because we are up at our top of the hour news break. And you know what? Maybe we'll get lucky and find a little good news in there. What do you think? Maybe so. We will catch you on the flip side of this. This is Fate Mag Radio, and we will be right back with David Weatherly and Ross Allison. Thank y'all so much, and y'all just come right back.
Support for this podcast and the following message come from Cayman Jack, who offers pre-mixed margaritas and mojitos so you can uncap and unwind. Find them at caymanjack.com. Please drink responsibly. Premium malt beverage, American Vintage Beverage Co., Chicago, Illinois. Live from NPR News in Washington, I'm Janine Herbst. Russia's investigative committee says at least 41 people are dead following the fiery emergency landing of a passenger jet in Moscow today. The BBC's Steve Rosenberg has more. The plane took off from Moscow's Sheremetyevo airport. It was bound for Murmansk. But shortly after takeoff, the crew issued a distress signal. The Suhoi superjet returned to make an emergency landing. Dramatic amateur video shows the rear half of the aircraft's fuselage engulfed in flames as the plane sped along the runway before it finally came to a stop. Rescue services were quickly on the scene. Many of the 78 passengers and crew escaped to safety down the plane's emergency slides. The BBC's Steve Rosenberg reporting. President Trump says he will raise tariffs on $200 billion worth of Chinese goods this Friday. The U.S. and China are currently engaged in talks to end the year-long trade war. And as NPR Shannon Van Zandt reports, so far the Trump administration hasn't brought up the treatment of China's Muslim ethnic minorities. China is holding up to a million Uyghurs and other ethnic minority Muslims in large internment camps. And while trade talks between the U.S. and China aim to rebalance the economic relationship, so far the Trump administration has left human rights off the table. Uyghur advocate Nuri Turkle spoke with NPR. Ongoing collective punishment of the Uyghur population with a racist character has not attracted necessary attention from the international community. The scale and scope of the ongoing crisis cries out for a global condemnation. Last year, China warned the U.S. it would retaliate in proportion if Washington imposed sanctions over the issue. Shannon Van Sant, NPR News, Washington. Spring flooding in the Midwest may get worse with more rain in the forecast today and into this week. NPR's Amy Held reports parts of the Mississippi River have been in major flood slage for more than a month. Over the next few days, three to five inches of rain is forecast to fall in eastern Nebraska, across northern Kansas, and into Wisconsin. So that's going to put the areas that are already in flooding into a higher stage of flooding. Greg Galena is a meteorologist at the Weather Prediction Center. He says it comes as the Mississippi and Missouri rivers, as well as the soil, are saturated from a historically wet winter, and snowmelt is still coming off the mountains. just hasn't had a time to have any respite because we continually have any systems coming through. Last week, the Mississippi reached a record level, inundating downtown Davenport, Iowa. Overall, flooding has cost more than a billion dollars in damages and claimed several lives. Forecasters say it could last until the summer. Amy Held, NPR News. And you're listening to NPR News from Washington. Germany's health minister says he would consider imposing strict fines on parents who refuse to vaccinate their children for measles. This is the number of people getting the virus rises. Anna Norskevich has more from Berlin. In an interview on Sunday with the best-selling tabloid Bild am Sonntag, Jens Spahn floated the idea of introducing legislation to fine parents nearly $3,000 for failing to vaccinate their school-aged children. He said those without the immunization for the contagious virus would also be prevented from accessing daycare centers to protect children who were too young to take a vaccine or were allergic to it. Germany has seen a spike in measles cases with 203 diagnoses reported in the first 10 weeks of 2019. Nearby Switzerland recently reported two deaths from the disease. For NPR News, I'm Anna Norskevich in Berlin. In Sri Lanka, Roman Catholic services in churches were canceled again this weekend as authorities continue to search for those involved in the Easter Sunday bombings that left more than 200 people dead. Father Prasad Harshana says he is praying for both the victims and the perpetrators of the attack. We are going to pray that the good Lord may not only heal the wounds of our people and console our hearts, May the good Lord also transform and change the hearts of those terrorists and all those who are involved in this process. Mass was offered on TV so people could watch from their homes. The priest spoke outside St. Anthony's Church in Colombo. That was one of the churches targeted in the attacks. I'm Janine Herbst, and you're listening to NPR News from Washington. 
Welcome back to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is five minutes after the hour. Welcome back to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. You are listening to Fate Mag Radio. I'm Kat Hobson, your host, and I am so pleased that you are here with us tonight. If you are listening on FateMag.com, thank you so much. And if you don't have a subscription, what are you waiting for? It's a great magazine. It's been in business for over 60 years now. And you know what? We have some great contributors, great articles, and it's a great source for anything that you might want to look at. We have the past editions available, and it's great and interesting and sometimes a little weird. That's what we do. I am so excited to be able to bring you tonight David Weatherly and Ross Allison. They are paranormal investigators. They are anomalous researchers of all type. They are both men who have traveled to learn. I find that very interesting and I admire it. It takes a lot to get out there into the world and find things that kind of make you go, hmm, and follow them through. I like that. David is also involved in cryptozoology, ufology, and he's been a radio host and appeared on television programs. And if you are looking for him, you can find him in a legion of places. And the same with Ross. Ross Allison is an author in his own right, and I'm so glad they have come together to collaborate with their work. And he is also the founder of A Ghost, and he is the, oh gosh, the owner of Spooky Tours of Seattle. Did I get that right? Am I close? No. No. Spooked in Seattle. (laughs) Spooked in Seattle. I even have it written down. Good heavens. This is getting embarrassing. I'm going to quiz you after the show. You know That's okay. I'll I'll take a written (laughs) quiz. (laughs) And I'm usually so great at that. Goodness. (laughs) But, yeah, you had something that you wanted to address that you had been that you had voiced a little concern about and go ahead. Well, I just wanted to, you know, for those listening to the show that, uh, you know, it's not me and David's intent to, you know, attack anybody that might be psychic and, and gifted in that way. We both have worked with some very gifted psychics throughout our career. Um, but, you know, unfortunately we've learned as, as being researchers is you can't be biased in your research as well. So as I was stating, you know, just because a psychic says this information, you cannot take that as, you know, proof to the paranormal. You know, we do have to do our work and try to either support their findings or, you know, to say, you know, I'm sorry, we can't prove that you are picking this up, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, for me, I mean, I've kind of uh, followed a, a parallel uh, path my whole life and delving into all of this strange phenomena, but also studying shamanism, which really does by default cause you to develop certain abilities and, and, you know, what people would sometimes turn psychic intuitions and so forth. But, you know, my, my thing is that I don't think you should rely on one singular piece of information. And that's, that's the problem that Ross and I are addressing with what we're talking about here in that a lot of these stories come from one singular uh, incident where a psychic came in and wove a great story, but what else is there to back it up? And, and as a result, it becomes a part of the folklore and more things kind of grow up and get added to it as opposed to people trying to get to the core and really figure out what's going on there. Uh, So, you know, it it would be as if you went into a haunted location with, I don't know, you know, just a REM pod and got reactions from that and wove a whole story based on on what had happened. And Ross and I have both seen similar incidents uh, occur. You know, I've seen other locations where someone had just used dowsing rods, for instance, in order to communicate or a Ouija board or, you know, whatever tool. And they believe that they got a whole uh, series of of pieces of information that 
uh, put together a story for them that, you know, in, in their mind and their belief system, it completely fits. But um, the case is you know, solved. Just, the mystery's done. Yeah, the, <laughs> and the case is solved. But, you know, I, I think that we have to be more open minded and, and look at various possibilities and certainly more evidence that corroborates, you know, whatever information was picked up that way. Right. Well, I think that it's all about collaboration. You know, you you have to have, I may get something while I'm on an investigation, but if there's not evidence supporting that, then it's not evidence. You know, you have to be able right. to back it up. And sure. I'm really a little, a little uptight about that for me personally. And that's okay. Everybody has their things. But I've worked with some who are amazing too. So, but I, I do think that and, and you just have to be to able realize, to verify. You know, and the thing too is people need to realize that even the most gifted psychic is not always going to be on 24 7, too. Well, and the most gifted, excuse me, the most gifted psychics are not 100% even when they are on a lot. In fact, probably yeah. closer to about 80. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's a That's great right. average. Oh, so, I agree with you. I mean, if, if everybody who did that with those gifts were right 80% of the time, just think how much we could rely on that. <laughs> you know? For sure. That, that's, that's a good score. But, you know, we need to realize that just like any piece of technology, you know, any, any piece of equipment that we utilize can give a false reading uh, for right. a variety of reasons. You know, we can get some incredible photographs that maybe there's a way to explain it, you know, whether it's something as simple as lens flare or something more complicated. So, you know, People who rely so heavily on psychics need to realize that too. Okay, yeah, that's information, but maybe you know, maybe there's a slight misinterpretation, or maybe it's a false reading. So right. you know, just like anything else, use it and use it to uh, you know use it along with other approaches to get that information. Right. Exactly. As I've always said, you know, with my team, it's just like, you know, yeah, I've used psychics in the past, but I only use them as a tool. I do not depend on a psychic or what a psychic has to offer. It's just another piece to that paranormal puzzle. Exactly. And I do like June is in chat. And she said, as Ross says, you can't prove the paranormal by using the paranormal. Yes. And even though a lot of our tools are not geared, you know, created for paranormal use, and a lot of people don't have any idea how they actually work to do the activity that they're recording, it's, it's still something you have to know what you're working with. Mm -hmm. And if you're getting a bunch of different things coming together, improving a statement by responding in ways that are accepted as being that, then it's a, a pretty, pretty amazing thing, I think. But I do like I the trust, but verify <laughs> it makes me feel safer <laughs> with what I say. Yes. <laughs> but, um, Jean also said that you have a person in your group that's blown her out of the water with some of the things. So you do have a lot of experience with that. Oh, yeah. I, I, I believe that there are people out there that do have, you know, some certain gifts out there. And um, I've seen them do amazing things. Um, but again, uh, as, as she stated, I've always said you can't use the paranormal to prove the paranormal. So, you know, if you are trying to be more scientific based and trying to prove that there could be something going on there, you cannot depend on a psychic to do that. Well, before we get on into the book, and since we're at this point in this conversation, I would like to ask both of you, David, with your background, moving through the different anomalous fields that you do, and Ross, you as well, but with the shamanism thrown in, when, when people 
<clears throat> who are more into the parapsychology side of this are saying that generally this isn't human related unless a human is manifesting something. What is your take on that? As to whether humans are creating hauntings, is that what you're asking? Creating hauntings, and that basically that's about the only way these things show up. Oh, I, I don't think that's the only way that things show up. But, you know, I'm a big proponent in the concept that we really don't completely understand the human energy field and how it interacts in these cases. So, you know, I, I've done a lot of work and have lectured extensively on the concept of tulpas, uh, which is the, uh, in, in short, it is the ability of a human to create something into eventually material form. And this really is an ancient Tibetan concept mm -hmm. and uh, sounds a bit out there at first, but when you start looking at it and you start correlating it with some things that science actually does now accept about the human energy field. Uh, I think that we really, you know, we have to, we have to consider these aspects carefully and think about uh, what dynamic, what effect uh, a human or a collection of people can have on a situation. And, and I'm really going beyond even the concept that uh, poltergeists, you know, are, are caused by, adolescent teens and things like that. I, I mm -hmm. think that we really need to study more closely how phenomena react when certain people are present or certain combinations of people are present. Thank you. I was just curious because you had brought up, you know, in the course of your studies and through shamanism where you had developed certain skills through that field of study. And that's why I, I wanted to ask you to address that. And that's a whole yeah, different sure. conversation. That's another two hours. So, uh, yeah. At <laughs> least. E at e least. Easily. Yeah. <laughs> so, because I, um, I am lucky enough to have met and learned from a Tibetan priest who had come over here. He's now teaching, or he was teaching at the University of Arkansas on Eastern philosophy. So... It's just interesting, the people that you run into and the ideas that come up. You know, I think it's when you have the opportunity to ask someone that who has studied as extensively as you have, you're going to take it or I'm going to take mm -hmm. it. <laughs> well, sure. And, you know, for, for me, I mean, one of the things that I think gave me a different perspective through the years is that having the opportunity to study with so many tribal elders, you know, mm -hmm. all of these older cultures, they don't look at this. Uh, they don't look at supernatural topics as something, um, you know, something outside the bounds of, of what is acceptable or the bounds of reality, because, you know, these tribal people, they'll just kind of nod their head and say, Oh yeah, you know, we know about that. We've, we've always known about that. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas, you know, the modern Western approach is uh, by default more skeptical and tries to be more scientific and says, oh, no, that can't be ghost, you know, it's got to be this or that, and, and tries to find a, quote, rational explanation, whereas older tribal cultures just nod their head in acceptance and say, oh, yeah, this has always happened. Uh, so, you know, I, I think ultimately the answers lie somewhere in between of, of trying to use elements of both approaches. And that's what I've tried to do you know, throughout my career is to um, use that, that open-minded perspective, but also approach a lot of these topics with a more, um, uh, with a different mindset that allows me to look at it from various perspectives and, and hopefully find some answers. Well, and you've and so educated from... yourself in that manner too. Right. Uh, I'm, I'm, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead David. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I was going to say, uh, you know, one of the unfortunate side effects of 
uh, delving deep into the world of the paranormal is that uh, the more you learn, the more questions you have. <laughs> right. you I know, have found I, that to be this, true. Uh, I've been in this field since the 70s, and I, I constantly have more questions. Right. Well, that being said, I can't believe this. We're at our break. So we've got to go. We'll be right back. Catch y'all on the flip side. You are listening to WPHM Digital Broadcasting. The best in paranormal talk radio. Come on, I'm Southern, but... Um, nope. That'll do. Hello, I am Kat Hobson, host of Paranormal Experience here on WBHN Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I enjoy having guests from all areas of the paranormal, from ghosts to ufology to cryptids and beyond. You'll find some of the best researchers in their fields bringing you some great information. Join me on Wednesday nights from 8 to 10 p. Eastern here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Son of a... Hey, son. Mother... (laughs) Uh, son, what are you doing? Hey, mom. I'm getting ready to listen to Periscope Uncensored. By expanding your vocabulary. Well, it is uncensored. Son, the uncensored part of Periscope Uncensored is Jax and I getting down to brass tacks with all aspects of the paranormal. There's no fluff on our show. So, no off-color commentary? I didn't say that. Awesome! (laughs) Son? Uh, I just hit my head. Oh boy, I'll go get you an ice pack. Catch Periscope Uncensored Thursday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern, only on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Since 1948, Fate Magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown, all of them true. Fate Radio is carrying on that tradition, bringing you the unusual, macabre, strange, and bizarre. Join host Cat Hops Sunday nights from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern on WBHM Digital Broadcast. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, Birmingham, Alabama. Thank you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is 23 minutes after the hour. Welcome back to Fate Mag Radio here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting, and I am Kat Hobson, your host, joined by David Weatherly and Ross Allison. They have come together collaborating as authors, as well as some of the other things that they do, and it's just fascinating to me, and I'm fortunate to be able to have this conversation. Welcome back, guys. Thanks. Great to be here. So, getting back to your book... Haunted Ships and Lighthouses, because that was kind of what we were focusing on. Um, were we finished with the the other line of conversation relevant to the evidence and the various methods of getting it? And Well, yes. Yeah, you know, for me, I, I you know, I was just going to point out it's on the on the last topic is just uh, how I proceed it is I can be a little more on the skeptic side. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I am one of those, you know, I, I like to see, you know, proof is in the sighting or the experience. Um, so for me, you know, that's how I've operated. But I also try to keep my group in a very, you know, down the, the middle of the road. You know, we don't try to get too metaphysical. Uh, and we don't try to be you know, too skeptical either. Um, I, I do believe if we can bring everybody together, 
and have a healthy debate, you know, we might come up with some more answers or ideas as to what could be happening out there. Absolutely. One of my friends always says, you know, it's nice to keep your mind open, but not so much that it falls down and runs away. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I try to achieve that goal. But, you know, when when it comes down to the work that y'all did, y'all did an awful lot of different types of research. Some of this was True. based on y'all's experience in the field and years of experience in the field. Some of it was just actual physical research with going through texts and histories and that type thing. How long did it take you to actually research the information for this book? Because you covered a lot of very diverse locations. I think, you know, a lot of it, you have to understand, comes from the fact that we've already been to a lot of these places. Yes. You know, me and David do travel a lot. Uh, we've had that, you know, that amazing adventure part of you know, the ghost hunting aspect. Um, so a lot of these places we've already been to. Uh, we've already, you know, maybe even written about some of these places in the past. So it was going back to our, you know, old writings and, you know, bringing that back up and doing continuing on from there. Um, but a lot of this, you know, comes from too, you know, doing cold calling, you know, calling these locations, seeing, you know, what's the updated experiences and hopefully they're still very supportive of the, of their encounters there. Sometimes they may hang up on you. That happens. (laughs) (laughs) Um, you know, so again, um, some of these, you know, easily could be, you know, years of research, you know, depending on how much we were involved in these locations and some of it's, you know, just coming up, you know, putting, you know, a good, you know, six months into it as you're, you're putting the book together. You know, it just varies on locations. It, it really does. And, you know, I mean, for myself, uh, I've done a number of books the past year and part of it is, uh, you know, I just have, I have so many cases and cases of files and, and, you know, information and journals and stuff from over the years of, uh, like Ross said, you know, extensive travel and investigations and talking to witnesses and everything else. And, uh, you know, it's it's not hard to say. I, I do get asked that question sometimes, you know, how long did it take you to, to research, you know, this book? And I say, well, <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I, I pulled the material together, but it's really the result of, of stuff that I've done, you know, over my you know, 40 years or so in the field doing this stuff. 40 years. Isn't that amazing? Time flies when you're having fun, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> we aren't going there <laughs> any further than that. But I am fortunate to be able to do what I love to do, too. So once you get the compilation put together, the the actual writing is just place by place what was the hardest location ship or lighthouse or one of each that y'all found to get the information gathered on and why oh my god the hardest huh i'm not sure on that one what about you david um you go yeah well i i don't i don't know uh I, I think for you, probably maybe the Flying Dutchman, because that's, you know, there's so many different versions to that story. But that, it actually wasn't because I had written about the Dutchman before. Uh, oh, okay. And, you know, but I, I mean, there is, you know, there is a matter of sorting out the different aspects of and, and the different versions of the story. Maybe the New London Ledge, maybe. I mean, it wasn't, wasn't really hard, but it was uh, an interesting challenge because... I did have to dig quite a bit and and talk to some of my contacts and so forth. And, you know, you really have to also carefully craft these things. I mean, we're not trying to offend anyone and we're also not trying to put out any information that would be potentially incorrect. So uh, Mm -hmm. as I stated earlier, you know, Ross and I make a great effort to, to try to get accurate information as, as much as we can. And uh, you know, 
a lot of this is based on our experience of being at the locations and our, our research and investigations. Uh, but sometimes you do have to look at a lot of different avenues. And, you know, for something like the New London Ledge, I mean, that was that was a variety of things. You know, that was talking to, to some of my contacts. That was digging into old archives and uh, news stories and historical records and things like that to try to get as much as I could to bring that account together so that, uh, you know, people in the future, if they, if they use our book as a point of reference, they'll go in armed with all the potentials of what might be going on there. Right. And, and, and like I said earlier too, there, there are some situations too, when you try to update some of these locations, um, the owners don't want to have anything to do with it. You know, um, you'll find situations where, right. you know, you, you call them and say, Hey, we'd like to include you in our book. You know, can you tell us, you know, what seems to be going on? Any updated experiences with like, this place isn't haunted. Goodbye. You know, yeah. you get that, you know, <laughs> yeah. believe it or not, Sloss well, Furnace went through that phase. Yeah. <laughs> the other, not thing, too long the other ago. thing that happens uh, too is, you know, with historical records, uh, and, and even newspaper accounts, a lot of times they will contradict each other. So, you know, you go back and start digging into news reports from the 1800s or even into the early 1900s, and you can find conflicting stories. You know, you can find variations on names. Uh, sometimes the, the first name will be completely different or there'll be variable spellings. And, you know, it's, it's a very interesting challenge to get as much correct information as you possibly can. All right. And, and there, there's situations where, you know, if you just run into a dead end, then, you know, we, we make the decision, I guess we'll just have to cut the story and, and move on to the next. There's a situation where, you know, with our haunted hotel book, you know, we had a hotel, David had a hotel written up. And uh, as you know, we've come to find out the stories weren't true. And, you know, we decided, well, I guess we're just going to have to pull the story, you know, just to appease people that were involved in it. So it's, it's a lot of that too, you know, you, you and, hope and that, that actually, that actually is a situation where uh, everyone, you know, to a certain degree, we would have been fine putting it out because everyone believes the accounts and the stories and, and there are witness accounts that go with it. But the uh, sort of, secret truth, if you will, is that, no, that's not exactly what's going on here. So, and, and I, I won't name the location for their uh, protection, but mm -hmm. it, it's a great example of the fact that, you know, sometimes when you, you dig just a little bit deeper, you find out that, wow, yeah, there's, there's something completely different going on here. Mm -hmm. That had to be a, a bit aggravating, though. To not be able to find the actual, you know, clarification. Uh, yeah. Well, as researchers, you know, you you always want to try, and authors as well, you want to get the, the true, you know, word out mm -hmm. as to what's going on, you know. But, you know, it, it can be frustrating when you don't get the support from, you know, obviously the, the current owners of the location you want to write about. So it, it can be very frustrating, yeah. Yeah. Well, what is your favorite thing about about doing your work? Other than the travel, because both of y'all have been <laughs> everywhere and <laughs> to so many different cultures and so many different countries and, you know, some much more isolated and away from what we consider reality living probably the true reality than us. And I know that the travel has to be the best, but what is, what makes you say, you know what, this is exactly what I was meant to do and why I'm doing it. it it's kind of funny for me because it all happened by accident. You know, yeah, I grew up with this passion for, you know, ghosts, loving ghost stories my whole life. Um, but I never thought I would be a ghost hunter, you know, a full time ghost hunter that that never crossed my mind. So, you know, for me, it just all just kind of happened. 
uh, the Northwest was, I guess, craving somebody to lead them when it came to, you know, pursuing the, the, the ghost aspect as what was happening out here. And I just happened to be that guy. I stepped up to the plate and it just kind of took off for me. But one of the things that I, I really enjoy about this is the adventure. You know, it, it, it's cool to, you know, yeah, travel around the world. But there's also the sense of adventure when you get to be sometimes the first person to investigate, you know, the basement of some of these amazing places or the attic, you know, and get to go to places where the public doesn't actually get access to. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there, that's kind of cool at sometimes, you know, it's just like just recently, you know, I took my team out to uh, Barkerville, Canada, uh, and that's a museum ghost town. And come to find out, you know, we were the first American group to actually investigate the place. We were the second, you know, ghost hunting group to ever been out there. And to to have that opportunity to, you know, dive into these stories and these experiences and this history, it, it, it's, it's amazing. And that makes it all worthwhile. Well, I have to ask, a museum ghost town? I've never yeah. heard, I've never heard of that. And that's, that's the great thing about it. A lot of people <laughs> haven't heard about it this is. place. Well, I mean, I've never even heard our places out west called that. You you hear ghost towns all the time, but... Yeah, a museum ghost town is just the fact that it is so well-preserved. It is almost like stepping back in time. You don't have these dilapidated buildings that are on the verge of falling apart like you do in a lot of these ghost towns. Mm -hmm. Um, This place is actually so well-preserved that, you know, when they open it up for the season, they get people to dress up in costume. They open up the bakery. You get to have food from that time. You know, they'll open up a few of the restaurants and, and you really feel like you've just stepped back to, you know, the 1800s. That is and so cool. It is. And these buildings are, you know, in great shape. So and they do everything they can to preserve this town. And it's in the middle it's, of nowhere. Yeah, it's, it's an amazing site. It really is. Ross and I first visited it uh, last year. We were asked to speak at a conference in Canada. And uh, during that trip. Uh, a friend of ours took us up to this location and uh, which, you know, it's, it's pretty far out and it's one of these places that gets an outrageous amount of snow during the winter and everything else. But uh, you know, you, you enter this town and it really is like stepping back in time. It's, it's impressive. I have to go. <laughs> this is the coolest thing ever. <laughs> that, I wish summer. That, oh, without a doubt. No doubt. I just could not, I don't do cold. I just never have been able to. I, I'm always amazed by the people that live with so much snow. I have friends in northern Wisconsin who are so excited because here it is mid-May and they can see grass. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm just like, oh my gosh, this is terrible. But I always tell my friends that have that experience that Delta is ready when you are. So that's okay. <laughs> and is that in the Northern Rockies? Is that the Rocky Mountain area? I'm not sure what they call the mountain area up there, but you're you're talking Northern Canada. It's about uh, 10 hours from uh, Seattle. So closer to the Yeah, it's a- yeah, that's way that's north it's northern British Columbia. Okay. Yeah. Well, good to know cuz now I have a place to start to go and do some research on it too. That that's astounding. You've just blown my mind just poof. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, that's one of the amazing things about, you know, pursuing this career. Is mm-hmm. just uh, that adventure, you, some of these places that you get to get into that the public doesn't always have access to. So for me, that is, you know, one of the cool things about it. Well, I am. Um, I would agree. I have been doing my radio shows for almost five years now. 
and I've been a paranormal investigator, obviously, for longer than that. And I'm always so flattered when people are like, well, would you like to come and check our place out? Well, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> so I do. And it's always just with a sense of wonder sometimes, like with what you experienced at, at Barkerville. Yeah, it's just a sense of wonder that these things are still preserved and they're still there. Granted, not in the condition that this is. That And people will let you come and see what you can find. See what they experience. And it really is a gift to be able to do those things. Ah, we have clarification in chat. It's the Caribou Mountains. And it was the main town of the Caribou Gold Rush in British Columbia. Yeah, Caribou. Yeah. Thank you, yeah, Mindy. But um, what, back to the book, we've only, well, we're like a minute away from a break. So <laughs> <laughs> we can't really delve into anything deep here. But when we do come back, I would like to, um, I would like to get an idea of what your your next plans are. David, I know that you have another book coming out solo. And I'm just going to go on record and say that I think it's very neat that you find all these people that you know and work with all these people that are such great investigators and experiencers in their field and collaborate with them. Case in point, right here. And... <laughs> I'd like to know what y'all are going to have coming up next and how people can get in touch with you. And I have a couple of more questions too. So we're going to go ahead and go to this break and we'll be right back. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk only on Paranormal Experience Radio. Broadcasting live, live, live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Thank you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is 45 minutes after the hour. Welcome back to Fate Mag Radio. I'm Kat Hobson, your host, and my guests tonight are Ross Allison and David Weatherly, and we have been having the best conversation. I feel like we have. I've had a great time. <laughs> so it's wonderful. Thank you. And... I would like it before we get out of time, if y'all could let people know how to find you. And I am going to, because I have to at this point, let you know that Ross is the founder of Advanced Ghost Hunters of Seattle, Tacoma, and the owner and tour guide at Spooked in Seattle Ghost Tours. 
Ding, ding, and ding, ding, ding. <laughs> die, right? I am so excited. I can sleep now. But, and you can find, tell them other ways that they can find you as well. Well, uh, I always encourage people to look me up on Facebook, Ross Allison Ghost Hunter, and uh, follow me on Facebook because throughout all of my travels, I do like to do a lot of live feeds so you can join me on some of these amazing investigations that I get into. So I always encourage that. Uh, so you can always check out a ghost at a ghost.org. And then, of course, Spooked in Seattle at spookedinseattle.com. And uh, definitely, if you're in the Seattle area, check out our tours. We've been voted as one of the top ghost tours in America. So that's pretty awesome. Um, and, you know, I think that those are pretty basics. And you can always find my books at Amazon.com as well. Thank you. And, David, you do everything. I... <laughs> <laughs> Don't leave it that uh... open. No, but I mean... <laughs> Yeah, you can find me on social media, too. Um, there's actually a new website that's coming fairly soon. It's going to be eerielights.com. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's not The website's not up yet. There's a Facebook page under eerielights.com or eerielights at Facebook. Uh, there's also an Instagram feed under eerielights. And uh, that's, that's really the best way to find me. There's a, a blog that's still up at Two Crows Paranormal dot blogspot.com mm -hmm. uh, that will eventually be melted into the website but uh, i'm on social media and of course all of my books can be found at amazon.com also as well as ross's so i wanted yeah, to put that right. out there too because ross you didn't mention that but oh that, my books oh yeah yes <laughs> and there, there. oh go ahead no, I was just going to say that they're pretty fascinating in their own right. You guys have done such great work individually and now collaborating. So I think that's pretty neat. Well, thank, well, thank you. you. Yeah. And what is your next big adventure for each of you? David, you want to go, go first? Oh. No, go ahead. <laughs> um. Right now, um, my sisters are taking me to New Orleans for my birthday. Oh, has so, Yeah, so that's going to be a lot of fun. So we go out to New Orleans, and uh, since we're going to be out there, I am going to introduce them to the Nottaway Plantation, uh, which is a place that uh, I got to investigate. Really amazing right, place. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we're going to be there for a couple nights. Um, so that's pretty much the... What I've got coming up right now, I also have a big project that's coming out, but unfortunately I can't say too much about it. Um, so just, you know, follow me on Facebook. I'd be more happy to announce it when that uh, information is available. Um, but right now, just uh, more books working with uh, with David. We got uh, a handful of books on our list as we slowly chip away at them. Um, our next big one is Haunted Churches. So watch for that. Uh, and then, you know, just a few little trips here and there. I think that's about all I got going on right now. How about you, David? Oh, gosh, tons of stuff. Uh, so I, I just released two books earlier this year, one in January and one just a couple of weeks ago. The first was Silver State Monsters on Cryptids and Legends in Nevada. And then Copper State Monsters came out a couple of weeks ago. That is on Cryptids and Legends of Arizona. Uh, I also have, of course, the Haunted Church, uh, Haunted Churches book that Ross and I are putting together. I have um, a book on the history of haunted dolls that will be out probably within about a month. Mm -hmm. And that delves not just into the modern famous haunted dolls like Robert and Annabelle, but also into uh, a lot of aspects of how dolls were used uh, in magical traditions around the world and, and the history of how we really came about having all of these weird associations with dolls. Uh, so again, that'll be out in about a month. I have a number of conferences coming up. I'll be speaking at the Pennsylvania Bigfoot ad camping adventure at the end of May. I've got a ancient mysteries cruise that I'll be speaking at in July. Uh, oh gosh. Uh, Summer haunt fest in Indiana in June and just tons of other travel and other projects unfolding 
uh, and there's so much of it I can't even keep track of it, but right off the top of my head, that's a few things. And like I stated earlier, a new website coming under EerieLights.com. So it's a it's a busy and exciting year. It is, and I don't I didn't write down. Did you have a drop date for the Erie Lights website? I'm I'm sorry. Did I have what? A drop date. A, do you know when that's no, going live? No, not yet. Um, for the moment, people can visit the Facebook page under Erie Lights, and of course, mm-hmm. the the website will be announced there. And like I said, Instagram also. Well, I am just really blown away. Y'all have got so much happening. And Ross, do you already have your plans in place for when you get to New Orleans? Do you know what you're going to do while you're there? Uh, not yet. I'll probably be doing some of the basic touristy things, you know, just because it's their first time there. I, I've been to New Orleans a few times. So that's why they want to take me there because they want to want me to show them around. And they love the, the ghost hunting stuff that I do. So, of course, I'll probably introduce them to some of the local haunts. Too Definitely bad. take them. Yeah, the cemeteries, of course. you got to see those. You know. So, you should yeah, hook them up basic. with Bloody Mary while you're there. She is an icon. <laughs> All right. So One of my she... favorite cities. Oh, yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. And fortunately... My children love it, too, because when we used to go to the beach in the summer, we would drive over to New Orleans for the day. And you just can't touch it. There's nothing. In my experience, I've done Savannah and New York City and all these other places. There's nothing like New Orleans. It's it's such a hodgepodge of so many different cultures that have come together to become just this beautiful city. That has oh, yeah. such a interesting and beautiful life to it. So yeah, it's one of the my history favorites alone too. is amazing. Yes, I am. I am just sitting on go for that too. <laughs> 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 so, is there anything else that you would like that I have missed? Which seems almost impossible, but it happens on the um, haunted ships and lighthouses. No, there's a lot of stories to cover. Um, so, you know, if anybody's interested in the subject matter, please, you know, check out the book. Um, we put a lot of work into this. And uh, and also consider the fact that, you know, this is just one out of the series that we are working on. So as, we, as David said, you know, we got haunted toys, Haunted Ships and Lighthouses, and the next one uh, to follow is Haunted Churches, and, you know, we've already got a whole line of books that we're going to be putting out, so do keep an eye on the Haunted series that we're working on. Well, you know, I have not started Haunted haunted Toys yet. I think that is such a interesting, and it just feels like a diabolical type of topic. Because <laughs> when you think about you know, it's it, it's kind of interesting because that one really has uh, it, it unnerved some people. You know, I, can I see I, that I, we've had people react and say, "No, no, I can't, I can't read that." <laughs> you know, because mm-hmm. they have uh, a, a lot of a lot of people have strange uh, mem- and, you know, strange experiences that they had as children mm-hmm. around toys, and uh, as a result, you know, we've had a, a few more stories come to us. Uh, since that book came out. So it, it's really interesting that it kind of um, sort of struck a nerve, you know, it in does. some ways. And uh, it, it's it's interesting for us as researchers and, and writers and investigators to see that reaction. Oh, yeah. And there's some games that you might want to try, too, after reading the book. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> yes, Gene and Chat just said, especially the games. Yeah, yep. <laughs> everybody loves to hear about the games. Well, I am looking forward to it, and I'll be sure to read it when I get up in the morning, as opposed to in the evenings. <laughs> but <laughs> one of the one of the gentlemen on one of the paranormal teams that I'm involved with is a haunted doll collector, which, as we have come across items on our investigations that had to leave the homes evolved into haunted items and he'll host a 
get together once a year so that we can go and see his new additions and that type of thing. And it is unnerving for a lot of people because he has over 200, 250 dolls. Three of them are from the Isle of the Dolls. And I know, right? It's so cool. And it's just amazing to me that he can sleep in the house. (laughs) But the majority of them consider him dead. Ross and I actually both have collections of haunted items. Now, uh, his are on display at Spooks in Seattle. So if you go and, and take one of his excellent ghost tours, then you'll get a chance to see a lot of those haunted items. And he, awesome. he neglected to mention tonight, uh, i got to give him uh, a plug for this, he has a death museum yep. at his location really? in Seattle. And it is a very unique attraction. It, it's like nothing... <laughs> you know, like nothing you've probably seen before with a lot of uh, various pieces of memorabilia, uh, a lot of Victorian items and morning attire and, and a whole range of things. And and uh, he doesn't talk about it too much, but Ross is, is quite knowledgeable when it comes to those customs and uh, as well as graveyard symbology and so forth. And uh, I keep encouraging him. He's got to get that solo book out on <laughs> I, I was waiting symbology. for that David <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but really because there aren't many people that are, are well versed in in that stuff and uh, the Death Museum is really cool plus if you go to Spooks you get to see Mr. Creepy the haunted <laughs> ventriloquist doll that he has uh, unfortunately my my items I, I keep them uh, I keep them in my home, so they're not on display currently, but I, I have some pretty fascinating haunted items myself. Yes, he and hoards I think them. That, he yeah, hoards I hoard them, them. Like, yeah. My precious, my precious. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think, you know, when you're in the field, when you're in the field for so long, it's it's almost inevitable that there are times when you have to deal with those items. You know, people will ask you to take something or, uh, you know, take it away or, they're convinced it has some terrible curse on it and they, they just want to be rid of it. So being in the field for so long, we've both had those situations where people have said, no, please get this out of my home. Yes. And uh, as a result, we have some interesting collections. I can only imagine. And would love to see them. (laughs) But, well, I have to tell y'all, this has been one of the best conversations that I've had in some time. I have enjoyed both of you and your information and I appreciate your time. I know that two hours is a good bit of time to take out of your evening. Thank you. Well, thank you. Yeah, for well, thanks us. for having us on. And with that being said, I am excited to tell y'all that we have a whole week worth of programming lined up for y'all. It's going to be amazing. On Monday nights, it's Denise Pridemore with the Paranormal Pride. On Wednesday nights, it's me again with Paranormal Experienced Radio. On Thursdays, we have Periscope Uncensored. On Fridays, it's a pretty big day. We start with Paraversal Universe at 5 p.m. Eastern, followed by Ghost Talk Radio with Shelley Burke Robertson. Followed by Tripping the Void with Seraphine Hurley. And then I'll be back on Sunday with Fate. So if you get a chance, you just never know what's going to strike your fancy. These are all fantastic shows and I think you'll enjoy them. So check them out. And thank you again, gentlemen. I appreciate y'all so much. Anytime. Thank you. Thank you. And we will catch you on the next show. Y'all have a fantastic. Make sure that you are being the change you want to see because every little thing you do creates that ripple. Have a great week. Don't forget, same cat time, same cat channel. Good night. You are listening to WPHM Digital Broadcasting. The best in paranormal.
Talk Radio.